Welcome back to Carnadies.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, Democracy and Development, Confronting a Central Ethical Dilemma of International Development with Lessons from Rwanda and the Gambia. In this video, we're looking at isolationist objections and responses to Wahale development. If you haven't watched the previous videos in this series, I would highly encourage that you do so, especially the one that comes right before this, where we outline and explain what we mean by Wahale development and the method for Wahale development. But really, the whole series is kind of important in understanding how we're building up to this point. Isolationists are those who don't think that we should engage in international development in the first place. Different kinds of isolationists may give different reasons for this position, but they are all bound together by the claim that the way to avoid the original dilemma is just to not do international development. We'll look at two forms of isolationism here, pragmatic isolationists and fundamentalist isolationists. Pragmatic isolationists claim that we are more likely to do harm through development by either giving groups the tools to do evil or by limiting their ability to engage in participatory decision making. Therefore, we should just not do development. The solution to the dilemma under this view is simply to not go as an external actor, since you will do more good by not even starting. In this view, the fact that a development worker may end up in a moral paradox is not a fact of bad moral luck, but rather a result of an attempt to do international development in the first place, and because of that bad result, you should just not do it. Even if some development workers do good, on average they'll do more harm by imposing their views or by giving groups the tools to do moral harm. The response from the perspective of Wahale development is that not going does do just as much harm in the form of depriving people of stories and relationships. One of the central tenets of the Wahale framework is that the relationships are a good in themselves and they should be the focus of the development work you're doing precisely because forming relationships with people from that are different from you decreases prejudices and increases tolerance for both the external actors. It increases the possibility of peace and future cultural exchange, but also for the community as well. This emotional education is central to an informed democracy. If you have a close relationship with someone that acts or looks different from you, you are less likely to immediately judge others who act or look that way. You're less likely to vote for policies which would discriminate against people like that. Solving the original dilemma of morally reprehensible but democratic choices simply by building relationships if doing nothing else. Despite ethical dilemmas, if development is done with relationships at its core, there will always be more good to come of it than bad, since it will lead people with to be less likely to support discriminatory policies. And if relationships are built at the core, then you should never sacrifice the relationship for the sake of some other development goal, be that democracy or be that a upholding a right or anything like that. The relationship should come first. To go further, if Wahale development is successful, neither negative conclusion should be realized in the first place. You should be able to avoid the original dilemma, and thus someone wouldn't even be doing any harm to begin with by going and doing development. So the point should be moot. The fundamentalist isolationist, on the other hand, claims that on a fundamental level, external forces have no place in development. According to this argument, any external intervention is simply a new form of colonialism, which is set on imposing the beliefs of the privileged on those in the developing countries. According to this view, the people must enact their own development, and interference from the outside is simply another form of oppression. In this view, something which may not seem intrusive, such as education or just sharing of stories, is in fact harmful and imperialist, and it imposes the views of one group disproportionately on another, because the group in power has media that is imposing their views, and money to just impose their views, whereas the group out of power only can receive and doesn't isn't allowed to provide their views on equal footing. In response, I would argue that if one truly enacts the principles of Wahali development, it should be an act of sharing stories, and sharing goes both ways, where both the external practitioner and the community are open to learning new things. 
This is far from oppressive. A relationship where either party can choose to walk away does not have an oppressive power dynamic in the same way where one party is forcing the other party to listen. An interaction where the relationship itself is the most important element is something that empowers and humanizes all involved instead of subverting humanity for some other goal. Be that promoting one's own values or colonialism or even better ideas of development. While groups in power may have more representation of their culture and views in the media, this also gives rise to greater misrepresentation of them, their cultures, and their views in the media, and a greater misunderstanding of who they actually are. A culture in power sharing their stories and perspectives may not be reinforcing messages in the media, but rather subverting them by demonstrating that those representations do not reflect the actual way that people in that culture of power live. And through the process of sharing, those people in that culture of power are given the opportunity to learn about a range of other cultures and ways that those cultures are even more greatly misrepresented in media and in other places. So once again, the harm done by the loss of cultural exchange is so great as to cause quite a problem for anyone that wants to claim that isolationism is the best choice that we have. And if you're doing Wahale development correctly, you should be sharing, you should be exchanging, you should be engaging with others. You shouldn't be imposing or forcing them to accept your ways. I'm also concerned with where such a view would draw the lines. Can someone from the city in the Gambia go and help the rural population, despite there being a power disparity there? Can someone from the next village over help someone? What counts as being external in this way? Could a uh, Gambian that had moved abroad come back to their country and do development? Could a Gambian that had moved abroad's children do that? How many generations do you need to be removed to count as an external actor? If you're distantly related to someone in the country, is that sufficient for being allowed to be within that community? What counts as making someone so external that they're not allowed to help, that they're not allowed to share and interact with the community? We should be conscious of these power dynamics, and we should try to correct for them and try to make sure that people and communities that have had less voice and less opportunity to share their stories are given more. But once again, there's so much good to be gained from positive interactions in general that limiting them seems to do more harm than good. And by isolating people and leaving them ignorant and hateful of others around them. The isolationist worries that the very act of engaging in international development may be harmful in practice or in principle. While there is always a possibility of harm, this position ignores the good which is done by people sharing stories and experience with each other. It overlooks how development which centers on relationships is successful when people learn about and engage with different cultures, even if the projects they engage in fail. And it fails to successfully draw a line between what should be considered external and what should not. The simple act that the isolationist tries to do in their original objection of trying to draw this line between us and them is harmful and washes over a great deal of nuance within identity and culture. What do you think? Did I defend the Wahali method of development sufficiently against the isolationist objections and responses? Would you have more objections to offer from a similar perspective or more responses to defend the argument? Write them in the comments below. Stay tuned next time for the colonialist objections and responses, and then the Boko Haram objections and responses. Watch this video and more here at carneades.org, and stay skeptical, everybody.